the West is also a complex term. Can you maybe first, before we get started into the thematics that you raise, what does the West mean to you? How do you define it? Quite an important early question. If we're talking about Westlessness, we do need to know what it is that's contracting. So the West has evolved over the centuries and It originates in Western Europe and what was old Christendom in Western Europe. And it has grown to expand to cover what became the British settler colonies of North America and Australasia. Also, briefly, places like Rhodesia, we're talking about Africa as well. Some settler colonies, of course, didn't hold on. Others have persisted in some sort of form. But generally speaking, it's North America, Western Europe and Australasia. But also, since the end of the Cold War, there's been the westernization of Eastern Europe with these countries, Romania, Hungary, Poland, others, joining the European Union, joining NATO. Critically, and this is to round off this sort of definition, Samuel Huntington, who you might recall wrote the very famous Clash of Civilizations, he excluded South America, Latin America, from his notion of the West. And this is a controversial point, which is that South Americans clearly have their genealogy, many of them anyway, in Europe. Catholicism spread from Europe. But there's a geopolitical and cultural outline to what the West is understood to to be today. And I think it really does centre around this Euro-Atlantic world of North America and Europe. And Australasia, which of course latterly is very closely now tied to the security frameworks of the US through all sorts of arrangements that they have. But I'll just, last thing to say on this is, people may have their slightly different definitions of what the West is, and I think that's okay, because it's not about being dogmatic. It is about seeing the evolution and the spread of Western European civilization and peoples over the last few centuries. So Japan is part of the G7, South Korea is part of the OECD, Singapore is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Are they Western in your, in your definition? Yeah, so again, you've got to use a few different phrases because you're quite right. I mean, yeah, arguably, Japan doesn't have an independent foreign policy. It's so closely tied to the US. And yeah, ditto South Korea is garrisoned by the large American force there that helps protect it. So the terms I would use, Eric, I would certainly say there's the sort of the cultural West, but there's also the non geographic West. Bit of a mouthful, but I think it's quite a nice phrase to use because it definitely encompasses Japan and South Korea. And there's one really crucial observation on that before we move on, which is the West used to be defined in racial terms, which was, to be, be very blunt, the West was white. And that was probably how it was defined for quite a long time. And I think Japan's inclusion in the post 1945 US led alliance system has sort of shown that the West could be a bit more inclusive. And that's a really crucial theme because as the the sort of the traditional western countries lose a little bit of their dominance around the world they've really got to attract more other countries to their camp japan is always this totemic example of what it can look like if you fully join the west geopolitically but stay culturally apart but as we all know japan joined in very unique circumstances in 1945 so you have all these different terms sort of the cultural west the geographic west the non-geographic west as well so, Samir, I was wondering, you know, in related terms, how you think about Western power. Like, you know, are there specific kind of strands of power that one thinks of as particularly Western? But then also, like, if you just think about, like, how the West kind of projects its power in the world, like, what does that power look like? So, great question, Kerbis, because the fun of writing this book was using lots of different metrics. So, many listeners would be familiar with the division between hard power and soft power hard power being military or economic or currency power, and soft power being about attracting others to your your ways of doing things. I wanted to go a little bit further than that, and I actually think there's been a lot of westernization of people's aspirations and identities around the world, all over the world. Of course, people learn those big four, five European languages, principally English, but also Spanish, French, Portuguese, because they want to participate in the global commons. They want to be able to get educations that relate back to what were the richest and most advanced parts of the world. So there's a whole, whole set of different levels in which the West's power and influence has been felt. There's the obvious point of US aircraft carriers, or before that, British imperial garrisons, French imperial garrisons. There's obvious points about the power of the US dollar which I do talk about. But then I get into these softer themes about how the West has been very aspirational and it's actually pulled people towards its orbit, not by making them Western, 
but I suppose encouraging them to westernize certain aspects of their tastes in films or music, or certain aspects of their behaviours as being more western through their languages or their dress. And that's not necessarily always insidious, I don't say that's a bad thing, I'm not saying that there's a bad thing around westernization. It's not always done forcefully, often it's done because it's... Uh, Sometimes because it's attractive, other times because the power of staying aloof, you don't have it. You've got to join in with the Western ways of doing things to make money, to get ahead, to get an education. It's across the spectrum, all of these things. And it's been really fun, as I say in the book, to compare apples and oranges, to compare things that don't always fit together, to almost audit the West's power and influence as it's developed over the centuries to where we are today.